can't tell if you guys can really hear me like swallowing, which is one of my worst favorite sounds when I hear people swallowing on video. So I try not to do it too much because sometimes it grosses me up. I love what has happened to Valentine's Day. When I was younger, it was such a big pressure event. Like, oh, is somebody going to send you flowers at work? Is your boyfriend going to do this? Is he going to do that? Do I don't have a boyfriend? Blah, blah, blah. I don't have someone special in my life. So therefore, Valentine's Day is for losers. Uh, and we've just sort of shifted that narrative, which I think is fantastic. We've shifted this narrative to, it's a day about love. It's a day about reaching out to our friends, our girlfriends. I love the whole idea of Valentine's Day, of women getting together and going, who cares? This is so much fun. So I think Valentine's Day has shifted for the good. And I am happy about that because who doesn't want to celebrate love and bring more love into the world? Because that's what we're all trying to do by being artists, right? Again, you know, my premise here with Coffee with Ronnie is we want to get down to business. We want to be able to, by the time it takes us to drink a cup of coffee, to really um, enjoy each other's company and learn something along the way. And I have some really great questions that have come to me from last week and also since last week. Okay, so let's get started. One of the things that I've learned over the years is whatever is presented to me is I really want to find the simplest, most practical solution to anything. For a lot of my life, spent a lot of time worrying and thinking about every single scenario that could happen. And what if this, what if that, what if I went down that road, what if I went down this road? And not that I'm totally over that, but I really try my best to come up in any given situation, whether it's a personal thing or a business thing, to look at finding the simplest, clearest, most practical answer to a question. And that is what I try to help my coaching clients do. And that is what I try to help myself do in any given scenario. So when I'm answering these questions, that's what I'm always looking for. What is the clearest way that we can do something and still, you know, and not go just freak out every single time a scenario comes up where you go, okay, now I have to figure this out. Let's go with simplicity and peaceful resolution of how these things are going to happen. So let's start with the first question. This is a question that came up last week from Denise, and I hope I understand this, Denise. The question was, she has, there's a website called Creative Marketplace where you can sell creative services or downloads, fonts, and things on Creative Marketplace, not unlike Etsy where you can sell downloads to people to use for card making or whatever they're going to use with your images. People sell fonts and downloads of images on those kinds of sites. And the question is, if she is indeed doing that, can she also license those designs to other companies? And the short answer is yes, um, but there's not always a short answer to that. If you have an active marketplace that you are selling downloads, most people sell either, they can download it for their personal use and then, or they, you can download it for extra for an extra charge to use for commercial with parameters around what does commercial mean. And so what you want to make sure is if you are granting a commercial license to someone that if you are granting them the right to license it to something like they could use that as an element on a greeting card or a sticker or a something that you then are you become a licensee basically and you're saying okay you can use this on this product which means I no longer have the right to do that on that because I just granted that to you. That gets a little bit in the weeds right at this moment, right start out, starting out, but I want you to understand that everything has its place. And so if you have downloads like that, maybe those are all just reserved for those kinds of people. And then you have your other portfolio that is purely for licensing. And I also believe that you should evaluate the performance of things. So, so if you have this stuff over here that is in your creative marketplace and you don't see any activity going with it, pull it out. Maybe you can work with it and it becomes part of your licensing portfolio or, or some other pathway for that. So you have to evaluate like, what did you grant someone else to do with that? Because they could theoretically license that same thing to another person. It, it can get a little sketchy. But the one thing I do know 
also is that our clients are human beings and they understand that we have to make a living. And so if they come onto your website and see that you have, we talked a little bit about this last week about having a print on demand shop, or if they see that you are selling downloads on Etsy or the creative marketplace, then they, they get, oh, okay, well, that's her business over here, but let me just look at the licensing stuff and see how that works. And so you can make it pretty clean. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. So the answer is yes and no, because that's <laughs> where most things land in this. Keep it clean, keep it very clean about what you're offering to each of those markets. And, and you know, our, the licensing people are going to understand that you have this other gig going. They're, they're okay with that as long as, there are no surprises for them that this image shows up someplace else that they did not expect it to be. Second question. This is from Sue, our friend Sue Zipkin. Um, how important is Instagram to your professional development as a working artist or as an illustrator? I think right now in the world in which we live, it's an expectation that you will be on some form of social media and Instagram as we know as artists is like eye candy. It's like the easiest and best for us, I think right now, because it gives you a couple of opportunities. For one thing, it's really visual, it's really fast. And so people can be looking at your images quickly and they can be commenting and they can be, you know, sort of cataloging who you are and watching who you are if in case you are a, a potential client. But with everything, you need to be doing it with intention and with some sort of strategy. It doesn't have to be like a super corporate business plan type strategy, but you need to be doing it with some sort of intention. What, what are you hoping your results will be? Are you talking to potential clients? Do you just want a bunch of fans that really think you're just awesome and just build this uh, group of people that are really just loving what you do and you, know, you can parlay that later into something? Or I see a lot of artists, uh, many of the people that follow me on Instagram are other artists, and which is great. You know, I mean, we love each other and that's a way for us to keep that connection going. But you should have some sort of intention of why you are there, not just, oh, I guess I have to be on Instagram. So you can make a choice about who, well, for one thing, who are you talking to or who is your ideal person you want to talk to? You might not get them, but if you can, if you know that you're just like, I don't care. I just want to be on here and have a bunch of people like me and that's fine. I mean, all of, all of it is fine. And then you have to think about your method. Some people are not comfortable mixing their personal life and their business life. Um, and some people are totally out there. They don't care. That again is a personal preference of what, how you want to handle your, your feed, what you want to be telling people, how out there you want to be. Um, some people want to keep their politics completely under wraps and just do their art and that's it. They don't want their kids' faces on there. All of that we respect and that is your choice to do whatever you like. But some people really want to show their personality and particularly if they're trying to build what we would call a lifestyle brand, then you'd kind of want to bring a lot more of you on there. But the one thing I do know is that it is a great place to show your personality and to show who you are kind of behind the scenes. So having an intention of what you want that to be. And of course, things can change and move as you grow and have different experiences. You want to make sure it's not all your feed isn't always, oh my gosh, look at this great thing that happened to me, you know, because people get bored with that really quickly or here's more product of mine, here's more product of mine, which you're always selling. So you wanna have a balance of being generous and having a community around you and serving that community in the way that they want to be served. But you have to have that idea in mind of who they are. The one thing I do know about Instagram or any social media is it is absolutely a long game and you have to be consistent and you have to be patient for things to happen. I mean, you could put 10 items, you know, 10 images up and some client goes, oh my gosh, we wanna do this giant line with you. But more than likely that's not going to happen. But over time, things will bubble up for you if you're doing it with intention and integrity and staying consistent to your message. The, the final thing I wanna say on that, except to see what 
um, you guys are saying, is that remember, even though we see other artists or other people where you're like, how did they get 60,000 followers? I mean, I feel like every one of mine is just a precious nugget. I'm like, oh, thank you. Except for all the, um, you know, gray haired Russian guys <laughs> that I block daily. But I mean, I feel like every follower to me is a precious gift. It's like, thank you. I'm glad you like being here. And if you go away in three days, well, whatever. I, I like that. And it's going to take time. You are not your numbers. Just like you're not the number on your scale, you are not the numbers on your Instagram feed. And you have to just serve you and your people in that process. And if it makes your eye twitch, don't do it at all. One other thing I want to say about Instagram is what I'm seeing an interesting trend, and I love this, is that people are using Instagram more and more as sort of a micro blog, that their text is much longer. It's more of a fully formed thought or an opinion or a this is what happened to me kind of a storytelling opportunity that before it was just, you know, here's cute, you know, here's my llama and here's a bunch of hashtags about llamas. And so, but now people are giving a little more in depth. So if you don't want to keep a blog on your website, which who does? <laughs> It's so hard, it's so hard, um, which is another topic for another day. But a micro blog on Instagram, you might wanna consider that because I've read some very long form Instagram posts from like Anne Lamott and people that are, you know, not necessarily in our inner circle. But I mean, I find it fascinating that people are using it in a much longer form. So you might wanna consider that if you don't want to make a commitment to a, a, a regular blog on your website. BJ says, I don't post a lot, but I know I need to do better, but I never want to post the newest stuff I'm working on. Advice? Um, I think that's fair. I mean, we are putting work out in the world that we want to license or sell to someone. And so sometimes you don't want to, I mean, you don't want to give away the store. So, but that is the opportunity to show a snippet of it, some sketches, the behind the scenes, you know, the, sort of setting the stage. And then when then it becomes a something, you can go, remember when we looked at these sketches? Oh my gosh, now it's coffee mugs, you know, or whatever that is. But I think you have to be judicious. And if you don't ever want to do that, don't. No one, no one, you know, I mean, I'm happy to see your garden because um, I, I get the feeling of who you are by what you are posting. And that builds the entire persona, if you will. I, people, people just want to get to know you. Oh, Sue, well, you can get over and go paint if you want to. I mean, you have my permission, but I am not the boss of you. How do we find the art director looking for license to art, dear Ronnie? Oh, golly, golly. That is a <laughs> huge topic. Um, I kind of like to do a little more, uh, maybe next week we do a little bit more on some of those techniques because... <sighs> It is a hard nut to crack. It really is. And you know, I just feel like there are techniques to do that, but there are no foolproof methods. There, I said it. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. Sorry, Sue, <laughs> that was as good as I could get. Okay, um, I got a really great question from um, a newer artist in our midst. Her name's Patty. She's got adorable stuff. And I didn't ask her if I could use her full name and all that. I probably could, but I didn't, so I won't. She asked, and dear, dear Patty told me that she had bought my book and she's taken some of my Skillshare classes, but she's a newbie and she wants to know what are some tips for totally fresh out of the box newbies to kind of find their anchor into this business. And okay, you've done all the right things so far. You've read my book. <laughs> plug and taking my still share classes. But I think you have to remember, we all have to remember that we didn't just get hatched out of an egg today and decide that we want to be an artist and, and move our artwork into the world. That is a process that has probably been coming for a while. But while that was coming, you were doing other things that have value. So we have to remember that other skills that we've accumulated along the way totally apply to what we're doing now. And we tend to want to just go, well, that was then and this is now and I don't know anything over here. But think of all the things you know over there. You might be an amazing organizer. You may be really good at helping people say things. You, you know, in other jobs, really start to cultivate 
some of the skills that you acquired before you got to this point where you said, by golly, I'm going to get my art onto products. So really think about what happened before and honor that and remember that you are skilled in many areas. And so you're not completely green and new unless you're 14 years old um, and just are a prodigy. Um, but I don't think any of us are 14 years old. That's the first thing. Remember how many skills you already have going into this that can be applied to this business. The other thing I know for sure is you don't have to know everything to get started. Often I see people get stuck in the preparation phase because they feel like, well, I still have to do prep because I'm not seasoned enough or I haven't paid my dues or whatever that is. You are never going to know everything. I don't know everything. And the, one of the reasons I don't know everything, even though I like to think I know everything, is everything keeps changing. The world in which we are living changes, how people buy changes, the styles change, all of this, the methods of doing things change. So we never really have it down. Like this is the exact thing I'm going to do for the next five years. You know, you can have a, you can have a fairly good idea of what you don't want to do for the next five years. But remember that you don't have to have everything, all your ducks in a row. Some of those ducks are going to be like over there and you'll gather them up. It's a horrible metaphor, but that's what I'm going with. And so just remember that you are free to bring your work out in the world without knowing every single thing about the business. And you will just accumulate that information along the way and you will get help when you need it. And you have to promise me that you will somehow get help before you start spinning your wheels. Another tip for newbies is please, please be yourself. This market that we're in craves new ideas even though sometimes we look at it and go, I've seen that a hundred times, but that's because we're so saturated in it. But fresh new ideas with an obvious point of view are really important in this market. You should be yourself. The people that have come before you have you know, forged a path, but that doesn't mean you should do artwork like they do. You should do artwork like you do and make it work in the marketplace, but stay fresh and stay in your viewpoint. Remember your viewpoint. Um, Cause that, that's what we all got. That's what we all got. And the method is mechanical. It's the bringing the ideas and bringing the, um, the joyful newness of what you have to the market is what is important and all the rest can be hired. So there you go on that. The other thing we have to remember is to really be kind to ourselves. Even though I said, you know a lot of stuff, we don't know everything. And, and I don't know if this is a woman thing or what, but we have a tendency to blame ourselves for a lot of things or, oh, I'll never get this or everybody's better than me or I'll never make it. It's too hard. There's too much competition. All of those things that we put on ourselves, just like we look in the mirror and go, oh my God, Blah, you know, whatever. Remember, we would never say those things to our best friend. We would never say, yeah, this is never going to work for you. You would find encouraging words to say to your friend. You would find a way to say, okay, well, let's put our heads together and make this work. Let's find that simple, practical solution. So be kind to yourself as much as you would be kind to another person. And that, that will sustain you over the years because nobody needs more negativity. And so just find those positive places and kick the other stuff to the curb. Debbie, as a new artist, how many pieces should we show to art directors or agents? I think that you have to, I, I'm not gonna give you an exact number of how many pieces you should have in your portfolio because portfolios grow, grow and change. Things go away, things get put in. And so there's usually an amount that you're comfortable with that is, still relevant to whoever you're talking to. I would say you should have enough. I mean, you might have one brilliant piece when you show it to an art director and they go, oh my God, that's fantastic. Well, what else you got? Because that's going to be their second question. So you have to have enough that you can show them that you can produce work and you can produce consistent work that has, you know, what you have going for it with your point of view and your skill and all of that. So there has to be enough to do that. If is that six collections, is that 12 collections? 
I kind of don't know. I mean, sometimes it can be one giant take it or leave it kind of collection is if, if it's like a total lifestyle point of view thing, then it's one. It's just big. If you are more of um, an artist that does like, here's my Christmas, you might want to have for Christmas and for Easter and for whatever as you go forward. So it, that has to balance. But again, don't get so tied up in that prep stage that you never get out in front of anybody. And I see that a lot where people just like, I don't have enough, I don't have enough. And we just go back to the studio and do more and none of it is tested. And so you have to have enough to go out there and test the waters, which is the scariest part, but not so many that if, if it's not resonating with anyone, you've spent a lot of time on stuff that doesn't, that won't necessarily find its place in the market. So there is a sweet spot in there. And again, that's where, and this is, you know, this is not to sell my services or anyone else's because there are other people that can help you to, to determine that, to look and go, okay, what is the most consistent looks that you have that feel like somebody would want to spend a little bit of time on? That was an answer that just doesn't have an answer. <laughs> Except enough, but not too much before it's, before it's tested out there in the market. So I hope that helped. Yeah, BJ, four things in your portfolio. I mean, seriously, I went to the stationery show to show my portfolio one year and I probably had 20 pieces and probably 10 of them were awful. But here I am. <laughs> well, they're awful now. They may not have been awful then. But it is, it is a growing and changing. It's your portfolio is a dynamic document. Things are going, things are coming all the time, all the time. And keeping it fresh, keeping it fresh and always feeling like it's you is the part that that's how you determine whether your portfolio is working for you or not, that you shouldn't cringe when you look at it. And I, <laughs> I have cringed. Um, I will say that particularly when I've been at a show and people are looking at my portfolio and they're like, mm. anyway, cringy. Yeah. BJ, exactly. You, you don't know, you don't know until you're showing it to people. And the other piece of that, which is the, th the part about the unknowing of this business is, we don't know if we've shown it to the right people. So that's why it's, it's a numbers game. So if you have a portfolio that you feel comfortable with and you send it out to 12 different people and you get nothing, either it's not the right timing or there can be any number, it's not right for them or whatever, or there's 12 other people that are gonna think it's the greatest thing ever, ever, ever. So that's why we have to keep doing this and tightening up our message and our and our what we're showing to people so we get more information. More information is better until you're so overwhelmed you can't stand it and then you call your friend. This was a really good question from Karen who asked, um, what do I think, and this is my opinion, um, what do I think are the three most important things in regard to having an agent? I used to be an agent and I've had agents and I work with a lot of agents. So I just said agents a whole bunch of times. Here's what I, th these are the things that are important to me when I was an agent and when I had an agent is that you want to know, to me, the most important thing was I wanted to know that they were getting my work in front of the most appropriate clients, potential clients. I didn't care if they were showing it to 400 people that had nothing to do with what I do. That, that's not a, who cares? I wanted to know that they were showing it to the appropriate clients. So if you are looking for an agent or you have an agent and you realize that, I'm just gonna use an example of say, you just really think your work would be fantastic on fabric, like fabric yardage. And they never show it to fabric people. They were like, yeah, that's not really our gig. We're more in greeting cards, whatever. You go, uh, wrong agent, or they want to do this or whatever. So you want to make sure that they are hitting the categories that are most appropriate for your work. I always say about agents is just because they don't, they want you doesn't mean you want them. It's kind of like dating. Just because somebody loves you doesn't mean you have to love them back. And it's Valentine's Day. So anyway, you want to make sure they're getting into the appropriate clients for you. Um, most people, and I am total agreement with this, you want to make sure that you are kept informed of what's happening out there. 
So if they have a meeting, if they've gone to a show, you should expect feedback within a reasonable length of time. You have to let them get over jet lag or dissecting what they learned in this fast paced, you know, if they've been to a show, but you should expect feedback. What did people like? What did people not like? What died on the table? What, you know, what was people were excited about? So you should, you should be getting regular feedback. You should also, I think the third thing for, at least for me, and was very important um, when I was an agent, is to, your agent should be a partner to you in charting your future course of action, but still respecting who you are and what you do. So you want to make sure that they're not saying, hey, I love these, you know, watercolor flowers of yours, but what's really selling is vector, you know, cute animals and you're like well that's not me well that's what we need you know you want to make sure that they are um, respecting what you do but giving you feedback on how you can improve that or what people are looking for more or subjects or whatever i would suggest that anyone that has an agent should absolutely figure in at least quarterly to schedule a skype meeting or some sort of meeting of the minds at least every three months to sit down and go so what do you think how are we doing what do you want? What are you hearing? What do you think I should do? Here's what I'm thinking. You would need to bring something to the table too. You can't sit back and wait for your agent to give you a shopping list of things that they're looking for. You need to have that conversation with each other. So uh, you should be doing that quarterly and you are both grown ups. You don't have to wait for them. You can just go, Hey, Joan, whatever. I just picked a name. It's not an agent. Um, and so, and just say, I'd like to sit down with you. What day is good next week? And set aside an hour to have that conversation. So those are the three most important things to me. And it just goes without saying that your agent should be paying you on time on a regular basis of whatever the agreed upon period of time that they're supposed to pay you and that everything is right, as right as can be. Having an agent is like having another spouse. Um, and so you have to make sure that that line of communication is open all the time. And you want to make sure that you are feeling like you are getting in front of the people, the kind of people you want to get in front of, because that's why you have an agent. Otherwise, you do it yourself. And sometimes that's the better route to go. So that was my fourth question today, which I was, I thought they were all really good. Um, we hit a, some nice topics here. Yes, Victoria, you're right. I mean, you've only seen a slice of people. And so there's, there are more people out there. Um, you're welcome, Laura. I'm, I'm happy that you feel that way. Um, so we're going to wrap this up because I think we've had our coffee. Keep in touch on the feed here of if you have more questions and we will be doing this next week. And so I invite you to come back. If you have any questions, there's, you know, a hundred different ways you can get a hold of me with your question. Sometimes I think, oh my gosh, do you, I'm sure you all do this where you're thinking, oh, I have to get back to so-and-so. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Was that an Instagram message? Was that an email? Was that a Facebook messenger? And I, you forget where they came into and where you have to communicate back to them. I don't know why that's become all of a sudden an issue for me, but I'm like, where did they come from? So let's wrap it up. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you have a lovely, love-filled day but that should mean loving yourself as much as you should because you are a wonderful person. I already know that. So everyone take care and I will see you next week, but you know where to find me. Take care. Bye.